Hello, my name is Dan and I'm a consulting engineer with Apple. Thank you for joining us for this JNUC 2020 session, Strategies for Securing Apple Devices. My colleague Papine and I will be discussing strategies for successfully securing mobile deployments of Apple products. Let's get started. Apple's goal has always been to create the best products that enrich people's lives. The experience the user has with those devices strongly influences how effective they are. Because of that, we believe there's a strong correlation between the tools people have and their productivity. People perform their best when they have access to the best tools. Many Apple devices are mobile, and this mobility inherently introduces risk. These devices may be connecting to hostile networks, or they can be lost or stolen. Apple designs security into the platforms at every level to protect users' data and privacy in the face of these threats. Apple goes to great lengths to secure this data from attackers attempting to get malicious code execution, attackers in a privileged network position, or even attackers with physical access to the device. But this mobility also includes great power and productivity. The ability to be productive regardless of physical location is an extraordinary opportunity. Information security teams tasked with ensuring the security of their Apple devices can follow some best practices when it comes to successfully securing Apple devices at scale. But first, let's look at a brief history of Apple mobile security over the years. My colleague Papine and I will review just some of the mobility and security features that have been introduced and refined through the years. Papine? Thanks, Dan. In 2007, Apple launched iPhone, revolutionizing mobility and redefining what it means to be connected while mobile. The following year, App Store was launched, enabling a secure marketplace where users could safely acquire apps to extend iPhone's capabilities. iPhone OS 2 also brought some enterprise-specific features, such as support for IPsec and 8021X, and of course, Exchange ActiveSync, enabling enterprise class email and calendar, as well as additional management capabilities. In 2009, iPhone OS 3 brought push notifications, over-the-air enrollment of certificate identities, and more setting the stage for future management at scale. Mac OS X 10.6 Snow Leopard brought a 64-bit kernel to Intel architecture Mac computers and native support for Exchange web services. In 2010, iPad was launched with iOS 4 and mobile device management was born, enabling remote provisioning, management, and remediation at global scale. Additional enterprise features included support for SSL VPN and multiple Exchange accounts iOS 5 brought over-the-air backup to iCloud, support for secure email, and cryptographic separation with data protection. Meanwhile, OS 10 10.7 Lion included a number of security improvements with file vault full drive encryption and application security with Gatekeeper. The Mac App Store launched as well, adding the safe marketplace option for Mac users that iPhone and iPad users had been using successfully. Line was also the first Mac operating system to only support Intel architectures. Siri launched with iOS 6 in 2012, enabling hands-free operation. Hardening features such as kernel address space randomization were also included, as was the ability to manage network traffic across all apps and services with the global proxy. On OS 10 10.8 Mountain Lion, gatekeeper protections, including application sandboxing, were enabled by default to protect the system from malicious software delivered outside the Mac App Store. Mobile device management came to the Mac and began a roughly annual major update cadence for the Mac. Automating the bootstrapping of devices into MDM with the device enrollment program and scaling the distribution of App Store software with the volume purchase program arrived in 2013. Additional features for iOS 7 include theft deterrence with activation lock, data leakage protection with managed apps and data, and per-app VPN. Hardware mitigations arrived with host pairing restrictions and single sign-on across apps and Safari domains with enterprise SSO. App updates became automatic, ensuring that users would transparently receive security and feature improvements for all their App Store apps. Of course, Touch ID launched with iPhone 5S, ushering in a new era of cryptographic protections with the hardware-backed key protections of the secure enclave and the ease of secure biometric authentication. OS 10 10.9 Mavericks was the first major version of the Mac operating system 
to be made available completely free of charge, enabling Mac users to update to the most secure version as easily as possible. Mavericks also included some under the hood improvements, including the ability to escrow file vault keys to assist in recovery operations. One year later, in 2014, DEP was opened up to resellers, greatly expanding the availability of the program. In iOS 8, the data protection class after first unlock became the default for App Store apps and key built-in apps. The mail app data protection class is even stricter, when unlocked only. For high security requirement environments, support for always on VPN and PK init was added, and APIs for Touch ID authentication and low-level networking authorization with the network extension framework were included. OS 10 10.10 Yosemite brought over-the-air software package installation via MDM, greatly enhancing the ability for admins to use pure mobile device management for software installations. Continuity debuted, enabling users to seamlessly transition document works in progress between iPhone, iPad, and Mac iOS 9 was hardened in 2015 with additional kernel protections, and OS 10 10.11 Al Capitan with system integrity protection protecting critical areas of the file system and running processes from tampering. Support for IKE v2 VPN and hardening of the cryptographic algorithms used in the network transport layer were enabled by default, protecting network activity from snooping and tampering iCloud two-factor authentication became the default, and DEP was expanded by 26 countries. In 2016, iOS 10 supported third-party VoIP apps. Apple School Manager debuted, and the kernel was hardened even further with kernel integrity protection. APFS was launched, SSL v3 and other weak ciphers were officially deprecated, and automatic support for certificate transparency added to mitigate against person-in-the-middle attacks. OS 10 became Mac OS 10.12 Sierra, Touch ID came to the Mac, native support for PIV token smart cards was included, and gatekeeper protections extended to code that applications downloaded after execution. In 2017, iOS removed support for 32-bit apps and added the ability to proxy DNS queries to servers under institutional control. Face ID launched with iPhone 10, dramatically decreasing biometric false accept rates. The ability to manually add iOS devices to DEP with Apple Configurator debuted, and the mail app supported OAuth flows for provisioning exchange accounts. The ability for MDM to pin enrollments to specific X509 certificates was added, mitigating an advanced persistent threat actor from coercing an enrollment into a rogue MDM server. And support for TLS version 1.3 was added to the platforms. macOS 10.13 High Sierra included significant privacy and transparency improvements for software requesting elevated privileges or access to sensitive data. iMac Pro was launched, including the T2 system on a chip, which brought with it cryptographic validation of the boot chain, as well as hardware-accelerated device-specific unique encryption to prevent cold boot and off-device brute force attacks. Over-the-air, file vault key escrow and firmware password management makes it easier to scale the management of these strong security features iOS 12 included USB restricted mode, mitigating external attacks via USB, even for potential future USB vulnerabilities. Apple Business Manager launched in 2018, and HTTP2 support was added to APNS, making it more performant and easier for developers to adopt, troubleshoot, and maintain. 2018 also brought Mac OS 1014 Mojave, announcing notarization that preemptively analyzes software distributed outside the Mac App Store for known malicious code. Hardened runtime is available for developers to easily opt into, preventing attackers from modifying the application's intended behaviors. The iPad operating system had added a number of iPad-specific UI and productivity enhancements and was renamed iPadOS in 2019. Both Apple School and Apple Business Manager added support for federated authentication iOS 13, iPadOS, and macOS 10.15 Catalina all include enrollment customization, making it easy to display an acceptable use policy or federated multi-factor authentication challenge during initial setup and provisioning into MDM. Customers using identity providers can use the IDP's companion AppSSO extension for single sign-on support across apps and services. 
and user enrollment is added as an option for BYOD environments offering more privacy protections for end-user data. The macOS Catalina system value is now mounted read-only. Notarization is required by default. Mac computers equipped with a T2 system on a chip gain activation lock. Support for 32-bit applications is removed and a new user space system extension framework endpoint security debuts, making it easier and safer to develop endpoint detection and response software for macOS. In 2020, macOS 11 Big Sur iOS and iPadOS 14 add support for encrypted DNS, securing DNS queries from spoofing, tampering, and ensuring privacy. The system volume in Big Sur is now cryptographically sealed, validated, and immutable from unauthorized tampering. Apps delivered via MDM can now be managed, much like they are on iOS and iPadOS. And of course, macOS running on custom Apple Silicon will bring even more improvements in power efficiency and security. As you can see, Apple has been at the forefront of mobile security for quite some time. From inventing mobile device management back in 2010 to best-in-class built-in device security at every layer, hardware, operating system, software, and network, Apple has consistently been innovating in mobility and protecting data in the face of the threats that mobility inherently introduces. Today, we are going to discuss three primary strategies to consider for a secure and successful deployment. Designing for mobility. Every part of the process, provisioning, management, detection, and incident response needs to take into account mobility. Prioritizing delivering security patches with software update is a critical piece of securing endpoints against known threats and endpoint detection and response capabilities to determine the health of the fleet by investigating anomalies and remediating suspicious behaviors. First, designing for mobility. To support a true zero-touch provisioning process, it is critical to support bootstrapping a device into management regardless of what network the device is on. Designing such a system means that an end user is able to bring an out-of-the-box device into compliance without IT intervention. This design paradigm can also create a mechanism where end users have the ability to remediate compliance issues on their own, force multiplying the institution's security team. Since enrollment into management will be internet-facing, some form of multi-factor authentication is critical to strongly authenticate the user performing the enrollment. We'll see how this works in a moment. Client certificate identities are a superior authenticator, both for security and the simplicity of the user experience. Supporting this in a mobile context will likely include some sort of PKI and a secure issuance strategy. To balance the need for security with the productivity needs of the use case, the emphasis is on endpoint telemetry gathering and analysis to detect anomalous events and leverage the strong policy engine in device management as part of the remediation strategy. A high-level network architectural diagram may look something like this. End users enroll their devices from any typical network. I'll refer to these as unmanaged or low side networks, indicated on the left side of this diagram. However, access to sensitive institutional services may reside only via secured networks. I'll refer to these as managed or high side networks on the right side of the diagram. Access to these networks will be restricted to strongly authenticated users and only known compliant institutional devices. And there are a few moving parts that make all this work. First, the device management solution must be internet facing. As many institutions move to cloud infrastructure, this is often already in place. It is critical to strongly authenticate the user's device MDM enrollment. This will involve some form of multi-factor authentication which typically requires an identity provider. Additionally, remote access to the high side networks may be exposed to the internet, so this needs to be strongly authenticated as well. Remote access will be authenticated with client certificate identities that can only be issued to strongly authenticated known compliant devices. These client certificate identities are also not able to be exported off the user's device. There are several options for enrolling client certificate identities to devices, and the appropriate options will depend on the specific implementations. So let's take a look at what this looks like for the end user. Once the device is connected to a network, the activation process recognizes this device as belonging to an institution enrolled with an Apple School or Apple Business Manager instance. This device is assigned to a device management server, or MDM, for automated device enrollment. As mentioned, to support the device enrollment from networks we don't control, the MDM is internet-facing. In this example, the MDM is federated with Microsoft Azure AD, 
and requires multi-factor authentication. A note on federation, this has no relation to the federation capabilities of Apple School or Apple Business Manager. Instead, this is a feature of the MDM itself. The MDM merely participates in the identity provider's SAML or OAuth flow, as would any other SaaS solution. Here we are showing Azure AD, but the IDP can be any number of common solutions. The user enters the username, and the SAML or OAuth flow identifies the user and prompts for a password. Upon successful username password challenge, next is the second factor challenge. In this case, the second factor is an SMS text message sent to a known mobile device. And since this is only a web view, the second factor could be any number of different types of factors, a temporary one-time password, a push notification, or potentially even a physical hardware token can all be options depending on the institution's specific requirements. Here, we're going to enforce policy to reduce the attack surface by balancing the use case with the threat model. Consider the built-in technologies that are enabled by default. For example, system integrity protection prevents malicious software from injecting code into running processes in an attempt to compromise that process. In macOS Big Sur, the signed system volume cryptographically seals the operating system to prevent tampering. All of this, along with application sandboxing, greatly reduces the damage malicious software can do, even if it manages to elevate to root privilege. Some institutions may want to restrict user administrative privilege to prevent the user from tampering with some of the management policies on the device. But it's critical to balance that strategy with the use case. For example, grammar school students may function perfectly fine as standard users, but this same policy may introduce considerable friction for other use cases such as power users like developers or executives. And this may outweigh any additional risk mitigation benefit. Using a client certificate identity for authentication is a benefit for both security and usability. This example indicates a client certificate identity being used to transparently authenticate to the native built-in Ike V2 VPN service for remote access, as well as an on-premises 802.1x EPLS Wi-Fi network. In this way, since the client certificate identity can only be enrolled by using MDM, where the enrollment has been strongly authenticated and institutional policy enforced, and the private key cannot be exported for use on a rogue device. This design strategy prevents non-compliant rogue devices from authenticating to your VPN or Wi-Fi network. Now I'd like to hand it over to Papine to discuss security patching by way of software update. Papine? Thank you, Dan. Hello, my name is Papine, and I'm a consulting engineer with Apple. So now that we've established the benefits of designing for mobility when deploying Apple devices, we also have to think about how this changes the legacy information security model. This model prioritizes focusing on physical security, relying on trusted networks, and limiting functionality in order to secure your fleet. These concepts do not apply to mobility models. If we focus on applying information security best practices, however, we can still ensure we are operating well above the security poverty line. So how can we make sure we limit the platform attack surface, contain impact, enforce strong authentication and authorization, and perform robust telemetry and threat analysis? When it comes to protecting your fleet from the most complete set of known vulnerabilities, ensuring it is running the latest version of the operating system is the number one priority. There is nothing else. Current OS versions do not have additional security patches to install or separate configurations that must be made. System resources that do receive additional updates like XProtect do so in the background without impacting the user experience. By ensuring current OS version adoptions across your fleet, an OS version query of an endpoint will tell you everything you need to know about its CVE impact status. CVEs which were resolved in an OS update are documented in a dedicated security update publication for each update and can be found on Apple's support site. And Apple is not alone in emphasizing OS updates as an important security practice. The Australian Signals Directorate, or ASD, recently published their Essential 8 guidelines, which is similar to the U.S. federal government's NIST 800-40 document, which defines guidance for enterprise batch management. The Essential 8 aims to define eight essential practices for organizations to follow in order to defeat 95% or more of cyber attacks if implemented at the highest maturity level. When combined with the fact that two out of ASD's eight essential practices cover applying operating system and application updates, it is clear how strongly they believe in the importance of patching. 
This is further emphasized with a timeline for updating software, which starts at one month for maturity level one, the lowest level, and drops down to only 48 hours for maturity level three, the highest. In short, the quicker an OS or software update can be delivered, the more secure your endpoints are. For more information about Apple's approach to secure software updates, we recommend checking out the platform security documentation on the Apple support site, which covers our platform security in depth. Some of the highlights as they pertain to secure software updates I want to mention here are the fact that Apple generally provides software updates for multiple generations of devices, with the ultimate goal being to make applying software updates as easy as possible. In addition, it's important to note that software updates use over-the-air delivery where possible in order to deliver only the required resources to perform the update, improving network efficiency. So now that we have established why software updates are essential, let's look at a few built-in ways we can ensure updates can be applied as quickly as possible. By adopting the native capabilities of our platforms, the window during which an operating system update must be postponed to account for incompatible third-party tooling can be reduced significantly. This shrinks the attack surface that exists when an OS update is available but has not yet been applied, enabling potential attackers to identify and exploit vulnerabilities against out-of-date endpoints. One example of native capabilities I want to discuss here is VPN. By using a strong VPN standard, such as Ike v2, which can be configured using configuration profiles, we can leverage the strong trust already established by an MDM to generate a non-exportable certificate identity that is unique to each one of your devices. The unique and trusted status of a device certificate can in many ways be considered a posture check by virtue of having been delivered only after a strongly authenticated device enrollment has occurred. In addition, when a device status changes based on anomalous behavior, it is just as easily revoked, containing it and limiting lateral movement. Another example of using native capabilities to cover certain endpoint security basics is Gatekeeper, specifically the default ability for a user with administrator privileges to bypass Gatekeeper protections by right-clicking on an application. By configuring Gatekeeper policy to disallow opening applications from the finder as seen here, it is possible to fully enforce running only trusted known good applications without the need for third-party tooling to enforce this policy. And due to general improvements to Gatekeeper that require notarization for most applications as of macOS 1015 Catalina, known malicious software is terminated regardless of how it is executed, whether via the finder or dock or via the terminal, even by a root user. And while we're on the topic of Gatekeeper, it is important to note that much of its behavior ranging from assessment to blocking or process termination generates log events. It is possible to configure logging subsystems to deliver additional data that is not available by default. By having more detailed logging data available, your security team will be able to do more effective threat hunting. For example, a simple command line query can be used to surface gatekeeper terminations, yielding timestamp, process ID, and path to the executable. The log command line binary can also provide JSON output for easy consumption by most security logging systems. And this brings us to our third strategy, endpoint detection and response. The practice of endpoint detection and response is driven by an organization's threat model and compliance requirements. As part of endpoint detection and response, we'll talk about three important topics that impact how your organization might address its specific needs. While considering the concepts of design for mobility, and emphasize software updates that we discussed earlier. When it comes to endpoint detection and response, there are three things to consider. Emphasize endpoint telemetry, adopting system extensions, and the performance of your tooling. We will look at how native capabilities can offer rich telemetry in order to submit to existing central security logging systems, how replacing kernel extensions with system extensions reduces the overall attack surface, and software update windows in particular and we'll talk about considerations to make when evaluating native and third-party tooling. Many of the built-in security protections, such as Gatekeeper, XProtect, Sandboxing, and Notarization, generate internal logs through the unified logging system. By default, these log events are kept in a memory buffer, and they can be viewed with the console application or via terminal. If your organization already uses a security incident and event management system, or SIEM, that gathers and analyzes security events, it is possible to surface this telemetry for analysis by a security team. Telemetry can be gathered using MDM-triggered scripting in its simplest form, or by using dedicated third-party tooling that leverages unified logging and other native telemetry frameworks. The goal is to use natively available sources of telemetry as much as possible. 
by ingesting device telemetry into a mature seam, security analysts can apply common security practices such as threat hunting and anomaly detection to macOS endpoints just as easily as they would with other platforms. In addition, most mature MDM vendors offer rich APIs that can be leveraged to trigger management controls based on security event analysis, such as revoking a Wi-Fi or VPN profile if a device reports certain security sensitive behaviors. Any third party application has the potential to enlarge the known attack surface of an operating system. The effect is greater when the application requires privileged access, such as root user privileges or by being kernel resident in the case of kernel extensions. Often, such privileged third-party applications require postponement of OS updates, as we previously discussed. To reduce the potential of third-party security tools impacting the OS attack surface, Apple has announced that kernel extensions will be replaced by system extensions. System extensions run developers' code in user space, which allows for easier development, debugging, and offers increased overall system stability. The system extensions transition started with the release of macOS 1015 Catalina and will progress further with the release of macOS 11 Big Sur this fall. System extension types include endpoint security, network extension, as well as device driver focus types. We strongly recommend talking to your security vendors about their plans to adopt system extensions and specifically the endpoint security and network extension frameworks. As far as performance consideration goes, let's look at it from the highest perspective. We want to empower our customers with the best available tools. We feel that an organization's security policies should not significantly impact the Apple user experience. And we offer a wide range of native capabilities to enable this. So when making security decisions, make sure to understand the performance impact any proposed solution or product has. Maintaining good security hygiene does not need to come at the cost of the user experience. Consider trade-offs in performance, deployment effort, and user experience when implementing new controls or updating existing ones. Native capabilities offer a great foundation to build upon, which could be carefully augmented with additional well-behaved solutions if needed. And with that, back to you, Dan. Thanks, Papine. Successfully managing Apple devices securely revolves around emphasis of these strategies. Designing for mobility, considering that the entire life cycle of the device may never be on premises. Prioritizing software update to protect against known patch vulnerabilities and taking advantage of built-in technologies as much as possible to protect against known malicious threats. And endpoint detection and response capabilities to be able to detect and respond to anything else as rapidly as possible. So finally, let's wrap up by reviewing some of the resources available to help you and your organization. All Mac security information is available on the Apple Platform Security website. This documentation now lists all software, hardware, and services features across platforms and includes new information around macOS security that was not previously published. If you're interested in testing new Apple software, any non-student managed Apple ID from Apple School Manager or Apple Business Manager can participate in our Apple Seed for IT program. This program allows you to get access to pre-release Apple software for testing in your environment, includes detailed test plans, and puts your feedback into a dedicated queue for filing feedback where issues and enhancements are reviewed by a team focused on education and enterprise. The release notes are also targeted at education and enterprise, which allows us to highlight any impactful changes or issues in the operating systems for organizations. New this year, we've added the ability to more easily track feedback filed by everyone within your organization by introducing teams. You can now easily reassign feedback to other colleagues to be able to more quickly provide responses to Apple when additional information is requested. We've also made it easier to capture diagnostic information from multiple devices, as long as they're logged in to the same iCloud account using a feature called multi-device diagnostics. This is especially helpful when filing feedback on services that often require logs from multiple devices, such as with continuity or AirDrop. Thank you.